the ever dumbest Land Rover mistake they installed in a vehicle and the dumbest... Hi, I'm Christian. And I'm Vera. And in this episode, we're going to fix, finally, the restricted performance issue of our new-to-us L405 Range Rover. And it was diagnosed by Land Rover with a stuck turbocharger actuator and a stuck turbocharger bypass valve for 2,800 euros repair cost. And in this episode, we're going to fix it for zero, but it took us four weeks. <laughs> Hope you enjoy the video. You're gonna see a lot of debugging and processing in this video with no success. But I really think it's very amusing, especially when you watch all the way to the end and learn what the final problem was. Especially if you got an L405, you're gonna be walk out to your car and fix the same thing and it was bugging you most likely for weeks and months. Oh, he's gonna open it and then it's never ever gonna close up again. Oh my god, he's looking for problems where there are no problems. Well, first of all, it's not leaking here at all. They supposed to leak here. It's a Land Rover. It's designed <laughs> to leak. Christian, what are you saying? The good thing is that we found the problem. I'm 100% for sure it's this valve. Okay, in this episode, we're going to attempt to remove the left-hand turbocharger actuator from our L405 Land Rover. Range Rover. Because it has a restricted performance issue caused by that actuator actually moving without having any command signal. Oh my god. Yeah. The first thing? The first thing I got to do is disconnect the battery. <laughs> and in order to disconnect the battery on this car, you got to remove the spare. Oh, look at that. Ah. Just so you get into a good mood when you start your repair, they have you removing the spare wheel. You lower it down. It's lowering. Yeah, Christian's not ready. I have to use a persuader here. These two nuts actually opened really easy. Where I had to struggle a bit is on this clamp, okay? I'm sure the desktop mechanics knew that already, but it's not enough to just loosen this clamp. It's actually, it has a recess, you can see that here. So you have to open it also up quite a bit and it doesn't want to open up. Now with the muffler out of the way, you can see here the actuator. This thing is directing the exhaust flow through the crossover pipe up there or through the turbocharger out this output here. That one was quite a puzzle. A puzzle or a battle? A battle and a puzzle. Oh. So that's another bowl which costs us hours on end. How can that little tapping with a hammer... That's not little tapping, that's like the blacksmith tapping. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Okay, right. yeah. So that piece took hours. No, it took about an hour. We started after lunch with this. So now it should be a piece of cake. You said that already three times and each time it took an hour or more. This fault is really easy. Oh, oh that was so easy. It is like a Toyota. Take oh it. my God. Huh? Okay, got it? That's this piece. What? That is our piece of interest. That is the piece of interest, yes. And I think this piece is not closing anymore properly so that the car leaks exhaust gases away from the first turbocharger. This is working. It's not stuck. And I can also not see that it opens by accident. The Land Rover diagnosis was that this part is stuck and it's not. Okay, so I'm gonna put it back. We are putting it all back together. But now we're using lots of copper grease. So if we have to take it all out again, it will be a breeze and a walk in the park. Oh, we have to take it all out again. Oh, we do? Yeah, because we're putting the old gaskets back in. So we put it back together with old gaskets. Yeah and do a test drive. Oh my God. 
so on a range for where you even need longer extensions than on a discovery. So Christian is mounting the muffler. 26 newton meters. I gotta say this was probably now the fourth or fifth unsuccessful repair where we did not find a root cause of this problem. Oh, we don't want to say that out loud. So, um, am I supposed to do something? Yes, but it's too late. I'm already doing it, okay? So, I got a new tool. This is a uh, grab my ass plier. <laughs> I can get these on relatively simple. See? This one also. How did we survive without that tool? It's a whole nother dimension of bad design. Yeah. You know, this little plastic piece holds this entire hose. This is just not very nicely done because it's only held by this little bolt and it's dangling here. So what are we doing now in another desperate attempt? Um, we're going to change the vacuum valve because it came through the mail today. <laughs> And I think it might be the problem, who knows? Just imagine if it's fixed now, you don't know what fixed the problem. Like so often. So, we're gonna change this out. Ah, okay. And uh, most likely that's also not the root cause. I bought it in the Netherlands. Ah, I'm going to the Netherlands tomorrow, to Eindhoven. Okay. Nobody cares about that. So, this is day number 127 in debugging my restricted performance issue. Now what I got going this time is I have my camera set up to the turbocharger actuator. This is the actuator. I got my camera pointed at it. Here's the camera mounted so that I can see this turbo actuator here. See? Then I got my gap tool here set up monitoring the command value and the actual value. And what I want to see is if this actuator actually moves without getting a command from the ECU because that would match the error message. It's already moving there. There I see it moving. That's really weird. And restricted performance is already there. Okay, now I'm gonna give it a boost event. I'm gonna pull the engine over two and a half thousand RPM. The turbocharger will actuate now. So I took this out now a second time, which was difficult without Vera. She's not around today. So I think if I got to replace this actuator for 700 to 900 euros, I may as well take it apart to see if I find the problem. Maybe I can fix it and save 700 euros. With a lace you can fix anything. See, there was a hole drilled into it and that's put on here. There we go. Let's open this up. So there's the spring inside, and I think the spring has just weakened. A little bit of a dangerous action here. Slow this down a little bit before it's gonna fly away like crazy. There. Yeah, very well, got it. So the question is, how do I get now a stronger spring than this? So I told you guys before, the difference between a 
hoarder and a collector is that the collector knows what he's got. So there are plenty of different springs. So here is the whole debacle. I got it all taken apart. Potentiometer. This is the housing here. It looks like it's made from stainless steel with the membrane. And the shaft, I'm gonna have to make a new shaft and put it in here. And then this is the actuator. I'm gonna have to remove that shaft piece here, what I cut off, and find a way to attach the new shaft to it. Now, I determined that this thing makes 15 millimeters of stroke. The initial default length of the spring when it is installed is 40 millimeters. So it goes from 40 minus 15 to 25 millimeters. This is the action it's doing. Over here are all the springs which I found. So I'm gonna measure the force what it has in the working range. Then I'm gonna multiply it by 150 percent. This spring indeed could have weakened. 40 millimeter is my preload position. And now I'm gonna push this down until I lightly hit. So my preload position at 40 millimeter is 3.8 kg. I got to replace these with 25 millimeter. That's now the position where the actuator is all the way out. 9.2 is good. Okay, I cut this off with the angle grinder and the camera wasn't running. I'm gonna have to bend this first leg now down a little bit. Old and new. You can see the new one is slightly longer, same diameter, and then the wire size on the old one is 3 millimeters. On the new one, it's 3.2. But let's measure that. New one. So that's 5.2. Let's see what it does now in the working position. 11.5. So it's 3 kg more to open it fully. I would say that's not bad. In that area where the valve opens prematurely, I'm increasing about 50%. In the fully extended out position, it's only 30%. This is because this one has more windings than this one. Got this part done. There's the shaft what I took out. We're gonna have to make a new one. You see the actuator. This is... Let me enjoy that too. This actuator, you can see. This is that part here, okay? Boop. Boop. And there, the purple line is the feedback value coming from that linear potentiometer. And the red line is the command from the ECU. And you can see it's working. As long as there is a command coming, the actuator is working, see? That's what it's doing. You know, where was the false actuation? I go all the way to the end and there is no actuation here. There is no signal, but the actuator is moving. So magically it moved. And that's why I thought, what is moving my actuator? Then I thought it's this valve. The bottom line is this spring weakened and by the slightest amount of vacuum, that actuator pushed open this valve. This potentiometer detected it and it said, what the hell? Why is this opening? I'm going to prompt the fault. So what is actuating our turbo shutoff valve? Where is that vacuum coming from? I basically drew myself a little schematic of oh the circuit. God. Magically, the air cleaner box has a vacuum line hooked up to this valve. As well hooked up to this valve is the vacuum pump. And what you can see is in the normal position where it's not actuated, the intake air box is connected to the turbocharger shutoff valve. When you floor the engine and you're below 2400 RPM, there is actually a vacuum, a slight vacuum in the air cleaner box. So my theory is this vacuum out of my air box is opening my turbocharger shutoff valve. This thing is not stuck open. 
This thing is not stuck open. In my video, you saw the ECU given a command. It responded perfectly. It's reacting to the air box negative pressure. And the only way I think this can happen is if this actuator has a weak spring, a weak lumpy spring. I took the thing out again, which was the second time. <laughs> and then I had the actuator here and I just took it apart. <laughs> oh my God. So if this thing cannot be salvaged by me now, we're going to be waiting and our car is on the lift. And you can see how the actuator works. So the output exhaust gases, they want to go in here, but they can't go in here. And you can see when the gases press on this section, it's not pushing this open. It's designed in such a way that it's not receiving any pressure to push this open. And once this thing open, clunk, the gases go in here, go in here, and then they go through the turbine and into the exhaust. So this is an extremely smart design. It has like a sealant lip here. This is like in a 45 degree bevel. And it has the same 4 to 5 degree bevel here. And this way, when this thing is in closed position, you hear it nicely close. No way that any gas pressure pushes this thing open because there is no surface area. And I bet there have been some really smart people involved in designing this. The problem is once your machine something like this open, okay. it's not so easy to close. I didn't think that bolt gets so soft so quickly. Second attempt, I got this now reamed open a little bit looser, so hopefully that's gonna work now. I wanna say that's on. Okay. This is already shrunk on to this shaft, so oh. it's probably pretty solid. But it would be dumb if I lose this somewhere in the field because the whole thing gets hot. We're going to put a pin right through here. Yeah, remember, if he screws it up, we're going to have to buy a new part for 900 euros, which is not available. Solid carbide drill, diameter 1.5 millimeter. I'm sure everybody has that at home in the kitchen drawer. So we are doomed. I don't have a two millimeter drill in my kitchen drawer. <laughs> in solid carbide. But good thing we have friends. So here is the queen. Not going anywhere anytime soon. Thank God we have a mall crawler. What is this? Wow. You just need a source for things like that. Ich danke dir, ne? Yeah. Do you have to return it? Uh, no, <laughs> he would not risk drilling into a part with a used drill, you know, what LR Time used to <laughs> mark up a turbocharger component. He saved the day, okay, because yes. I did not expect this material to be that hard. Oh, no, still the dowel pin has to fit. So I can press that in. That looks dangerous. See, it's now got a little flat to it. Oh, See really? right here? Yeah. So, anybody thinks this is good enough or is it gonna come out? It's not gonna come out. Turbocharger shutoff valve, which is now serviceable. Let's hope we never have to service it again because of a spongy spring. If you screw that step up now. So he's cutting an M3 thread. Times eight. Yes, by hand. I would never get that in crooked. <laughs> oh my God. We're gonna have to touch this up. With a power tool. Oh okay. my God. 
So this part yes. is the clamp ring, okay. So that is a spring that was installed, which is, and that is the one Christian made now. We can actually put this baby back together now. Oh my God, let's have lunch first. <sighs> he machined that and that. Good enough. Click, click. <laughs> I just assembled it to practice if it really works, okay? Now I can take it apart and put the spring in, okay? That was all planned out to be like this. <laughs> I don't think so. He forgot to put in the spring. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna align this by two hundredths of a millimeter, not one hundredths. Good that I practiced this before. <laughs> it's much it's much stronger than before, that's for sure. Yeah? Yeah. I verified the stroke in both positions and it's 28 and 43, which gives us exactly 15. We have anyway no other choice. We fixed it. We're going to install it, but we're going to have to mod this heat shield now still. Okay. So this is all done. We're touched by LR time. Okay. On a Range Rover, it's even more important to have lots of extensions. Perfect. Got new gaskets now. OEM. Quick. So quick. Give it all you got. It's 26.5 <laughs> Newton meters. I don't know why I only get into trouble today. It's no fun working on that Range Rover. There's the fault. I just saw it. Okay, here it is again. So, my spring idea didn't work. So I'm taking it out now for, I think, the third time. The good thing is, it only takes now about 45 minutes, including taking the exhaust off. I think I've chosen the correct picture for my presentation, because since I got the car, that's where it is. Okay, let's look at our table right there. So right now we got this spring installed here and it got 66 Newton at start and that's apparently too much. So I think 49 to 59 is the way to go. 49 would meet the OEM spring needs only to be two millimeters longer. And I'm going to give this baby now a pull. There's 51. LR time, the second. So what did you do now? We had it at 48 and my spring calculator said 39. That's where it reacted stupid. And now I put it between 50 and 52, so we're somewhere between 49 and 59. So we'll put it back in. I'm oh really my God. Now. So we're finished for the third time now. <laughs> Fault's still there. When I give it slight gas, the actuator opens and it goes into restricted performance. So the little bit of vacuum from our airbox opens this actuator. Test drive not successful, you gotta say something. Yeah. Now oh, guess what I got Christian as a pre-Christmas gift. So we're gonna use that smoke generator here. Yes, because Christian, well, our old smoke generator melted. <laughs> So that's just from the plug. Nothing is coming out down here. So she doesn't believe me that she's all black in her face, okay? But I don't got black hands. Yeah, so it must be a mystery. <laughs> yeah. Though I have lost count on how many parts we have taken out of that car to manipulate something and put back in. 
for test purposes only. <laughs> Say again what you just told me. Well, without the thing, we could have a runaway diesel. Oh my God! <laughs> and the green is just the perfect car for a runaway diesel. Just for testing purposes, we don't leave it installed. We completed our EGR valve test and there is absolutely zero leakage, 100% for sure. Basically I blocked the EGR valve right here and I took the throttle out and this way the EGR is completely blanked and the ECU did not know about it. And I get exactly the same boost pressure as I get with the EGR installed, which means we're not losing anything by backfeeding pressure into the EGR exhaust system. What you will enjoy in a 20 minute video has been going on for more than four weeks in our drive. <laughs> yeah, and this morning I got up at 4.30 because I couldn't sleep anymore and I did a test and then the test was positive. I thought I got it. I just misread my diagnostic tool. So two or three times a week Christian comes, <laughs> comes up and says, I found the problem. <laughs> He's just gonna have to take some money into his hand and uh, deal with the problem. Taking money into my hand and throwing parts at it is not really my style. Yes, but we're gonna work on that car for another four weeks and have no footage and no content. Look at that car. It's a really pretty car and it has massage seats. So I actually do like driving it. What I mean is he has no problem spending that much money you know on tools but on an actual part which gets the car running up again he refuses throwing parts at it anybody can do that i want to know what's wrong with it before i throw parts at oh it. you know what's wrong with think it think about if we think about if we would have followed the diagnostic from land rover would have, we would have spent already now two thousand euros without having the problem fixed and by narrowing it down the way we did we know for sure that those parts are not the problem, even if I thought they were the problem. <laughs> Putting the flap back in with the correct tool. You could stick an arrow <laughs> wrench into this bolt if it's a torx bolt. That would happen to nobody. Don't forget to take out the EGR planking like we did on my Discovery 3 once. The problem we're having is basically that the boost pressure from the primary turbocharger at 1750 rpm just like specified is about 210 kilopascal and from that point on when the rpm increases to 2500 rpm the boost pressure is strongly declining down to 180 kilopascal and it's supposed to go up okay things going down is never good so what we basically got is a turbocharger, a primary turbocharger, which is not delivering the pressure it's supposed to deliver, but it's actually pulling the airflow. It's pulling all that air, but it's not converting it into pressure for some reason. And that could be the variable vane actuator from the turbocharger. And that's what we're gonna check next. It's nothing simple. Yeah, it's nothing simple. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to make a whole new spare parts back for that car. So I got it on the lift. Well, basically there was a recall because of oil in the turbocharger vane actuator, which is this thing right here, okay? And you can see mine is quite oily. I already washed it off a few times and it keeps on losing oil. The thing is, there is no oil connection to the vane actuator. So how does the oil get in? it gets in through the wiring harness and that oil is coming from the oil level sensor and there was actually a recall or a service bulletin from Land Rover how to fix that and I can see that this additional connector is not installed on this vehicle. I'm gonna have to take the starter motor out to show you guys this and to fix this. There is the starter motor out of the way. I'm gonna get it out of camera. My camera girl is cooking lunch. So you're saying that was the easiest starter motor retrieval you ever had done on a Land Rover? Oh my god, that was like five minutes. It was like six minutes. Oh my god, Chris. <laughs> really Here you can see the connector from the oil level sensor. That connector is pulling oil 
and then feeding it into the wiring harness. So oh there is plenty of oil in this connector. And then it's rinsing out of the variable vane turbocharger actuator, which is this device right here. Could that be our problem or is that an additional problem? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I know as much about a Range Rover huh? as I know about a Toyota. I got the actuator out. Okay, that was actually not very difficult. The connector is oily on the outside, but there's no oil on the inside. It's fairly clean in there. I still gonna open it up. This thing is now open. So this thing is completely dry here on the inside. And it got a really good gasket and you can see how it kept the oil out. So I got this thing back together and it's really a good quality part. I can reinstall this into the vehicle. So while we add it, we're going to carry out that service instruction here because of those oily connectors. N375V2, basically the connector from the oil level sensor gets an additional cable. That cable is going to be a little bit modified here. And what they do is they attach like a protection sleeve, probably because of temperature. And then they install this cable in addition to the original plug. So it looks like this. So basically, instead of plugging this in directly, they're going to put this cable in between and fasten it down here. I got this cable right here. This is not new. This is a used cable, what I took out of a Discovery 4, where I replaced the oil level sensor. But for this purpose, that cable is still good. And I also put some of this leaf material on here, which Vera bought me plenty of it. Now I put the connector in, which is the same one, into the same bolt hole here there and now this plug gotta go into here and now it's insulated as you can see so now let's get that actuator back in you can see here is the actuator rod it's behind the bracket for you guys but i can move it freely and it goes from end stop to end stop so let's get that actuator back in here it's all not that easy without my camera girl <laughs> this tiny clip gotta go on here Yep, looks by hand. Let's see if this goes in as easy as it came out. Starter motor is back in. Turbocharger vein actuator is back in. And I did this service bulletin update. Probably didn't make a difference but it does feel okay. Here I got my inspection cam inserted into the air intake and here's my turbocharger and I would say it basically looks like new. I got a camera which you can remotely wiggle like this. <laughs> it's so cute. It's like a worm, okay? <laughs> Check the secondary turbo. You guys watch Tremors. I'm gonna show where you put the hose. Oh, you're, uh, gonna the, put, the... you're gonna show where I put it in. So that is a second turbo. Oh, and look at that! My hose is almost all the oh way in god, there. Oh my god! It looks clean. There's no oil, no whatsoever. That is the problem here and here. Why we don't have a problem on the secondary side? Yes. Now I need to turn on the heat. And, and the I massage. need to turn the heat off and the massage off. Okay, oh. we're all set to drive. So now everything is like in a Discovery 4, just quieter. The steering wheel is really cool. It's better than on a Discovery. Okay, so are we pointing out stuff which is better on a Discovery now? Apparently. Oh. It's more responsive than a Discovery. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Okay, it's more responsive than my Discovery. So it took me four weeks to find this problem and it's kind of embarrassing but it's even more embarrassing for Land Rover I think those are the three values we want to see during our test drive you know how we said we're gonna fix that problem on our way home to McDonald's yeah you could have we could have really <laughs> I was too stupid okay. oh my god but instead it took me four demanding and hard weeks. Yes, because we were looking for a mechanical I, failure. Yeah, and I yeah. was working on it every evening. Yes. Doing test drives and stuff. I mean, for crying out loud, I used an entire gas tank and the thing holds a hundred liter diesel <laughs> on test drives. And I could not figure out the problem. And it was at the tip of my fingers, literally.
Go oh, into okay. manual mode so it doesn't shift. Okay, let me get it to 1500 RPM. There's uh -huh. a straight section of road, okay? Look at that. Look at the response from the turbocharger. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> this is unbelievable. So that's a V8. Yeah, did you see how that turbocharger reacts to the yes. boost pressure? It's like instant. We come around yeah. the curve here. And that stretch of road is not long. Now watch it. Do you see the blue and the purple line? Holy cow. And this ditch, that's yeah. where the turbocharger shifted. Oh my god. Okay, now watch it. That's 2200 RPM now. Look how it responds. Look at it. Look at that. That's unbelievable. Oh, no. Make you find the problem. I'm going to put the problem back and then you find it. The no, problem. don't put the problem back. See, we in Germany, we got these, these little reflective posts on the side of the road and every curve has like a bunch of signs like you would be on a racetrack. That's entire Germany is like that. And I bet there are dozens of cars out there with the same problem and the owners are baffled and they keep investing money. Would have Land Rover fixed it? That no, of no, definitely that not. 2,700 euros? They would have fixed it by accident, just like I did, but it did not need a single part, not even a piece of tape. It needed no tie wrap and no nothing. The mood in our household was kind of down for the last four weeks. <laughs> yeah, because we couldn't fix the queen. The queen didn't drive right. Don't want to know how many times I was sent away. <laughs> yeah, countless times, countless okay? Times. Like I said, I found the problem when I watched the footage from our test drive. So, so really, the only thing we can complain to the kid about... What? This is Land Rover dampening material, okay? Oh, right okay. here. See, it it's goes exactly like here. trash. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna do the hot and cold. You have to touch stuff, otherwise we're gonna be here in an hour. Cold. Warmer. Oh my God. Warmer. Well, but... Warmer. <laughs> colder. <laughs> Warmer. Colder. But there is nothing in here. Yeah. There is a... Well, you have to expand your exploration range. <laughs> colder. You actually commented on it. I, I give you one more hint. Yes. Trash bag. That's what you said. Trash bag. It's like yeah. trash. Colder. Colder. Oh, Warmer. Cat. Very hot. <laughs> That Very hot. Bag, yes. That's the trash bag. What does that do? Now explain it to our viewers. It plugs the air intake. And where's the air intake? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Took me only four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a trash bag. What they put in here is insulation. Okay. Here you can see how that trash bag so that is, OEM? is. That's OEM. Look how it is over here. The trash bag is actually shoved all the way back in there to dampen the noise back here, or I don't know, maybe a wind noise, okay? So anyway, the trash bag is all the way back in there. You can see that right here, all the way. And on the other side, during the test drive, I had this on my fingers and I actually scooped it over like this. What? This is Land Rover dampening material, okay? And you said, that's a trash bag. Yes. <laughs> and it came back out during the next days. It came back and it fell right here and it blocks the intake. And that's the whistling noise we heard. And that is what caused it. Yeah, if, if the turbocharger wants to actuate, it doesn't get any air. It can't breeze. That it caused, can't breeze. You it said can't for breeze. four weeks, it can't breeze. Yes, and then what it does, it's in the air box. It's causing a vacuum. Yeah. That vacuum is actually here then picked up by this hose. The vacuum in the airbox is picked up by this little hose here. This hose is the perch hose to the vacuum valves. The vacuum valves of the turbocharger shutoff valve and the vacuum valve to the turbocharger actuation valve. And once they get a vacuum, they start to move. And then the ECU registered an unexpected motion. The very first diagnosis in the Land Rover workshop manual was blocked air intake. <laughs> so I went here, there ain't no nothing blocked. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Christian, Christian blame. 
Die Airfilter. Die Airfilter. The airfilter is too dense. <laughs> the airfilter is too dense. That was then I was bitching and yapping about M A N N. I want you guys to be honest, you L405 drivers, okay? I want you guys to tell me if this is a known problem, if this happened to someone, and I also I want you all walk out to your L405 queen and check where that bag is and maybe you have this problem. I watched so many videos with the same problem and people couldn't narrow it down. They couldn't find it just like I. So I thought, well, at least I'm not the only dumbass. But Christian, we have four weeks of footage and you're just yes. gonna make that video? I, yeah, no. I make one video now and that video is 20 minutes and four weeks of footage are wasted. We have now footage probably 10 hours of me fixing stuff and machining stuff and diagnosing stuff and doing smoke tests and taking stuff apart and putting it back together, re-engineering stuff, reverse engineering stuff, figuring out volumes and calculating airflows and everything. I even got a new hat because of it, okay? I got a CERN hat now out of Switzerland from Miro, a patron from us, because my NASA hat didn't fix it. <laughs> and that actually I found the problem on the day where Miro sent us that hat. Unbelievable. But, but you know, Let me take this bag out and show you guys that bag, okay? See, it's it's a triangular shape. There is a piece of foam inside. And it's the same material as what people use to fill up landfills. And that was in here. And you can see that shape was normally crumbled up and it goes all the way down here. So I think it's reducing wind noise. I'm actually pretty positive this is a wind noise reduction. And that's what Land Rover diagnosed as a bad turbocharger shutoff valve and a bad turbocharger actuation valve down here for a repair cost of 2,700 euros. And we got it 2,700 euros cheaper from the used car sales kit. We got it fixed during our test drive because on our way home this was scooped out of the way and it worked and then it came back i'm not gonna throw this in the trash now i'm gonna put it back here you should put a sticker on gonna, it because this is the ever dumbest land rover mistake they installed in a vehicle and the dumbest false land rover diagnosis they've done on the entire planet and it was for me the lowest performance in diagnosing a fault <laughs> Okay, no doubt that the dumbest of all of those people is me because I could not find this for four weeks. <laughs> and it's really embarrassing for me, okay, but that's the truth. That's what we show in our videos. We do not do any voiceover, we do not do any picture over or B roll stuff. Everything you see is as it was filmed. So was this. So that's the honest truth. It's even if I wasted four weeks out of my life. I gotta put it back in, okay? It's just too good to be true. This is now a part of bad engineering and I don't want to take that out. I'm gonna shove it all the way down in there and if the fall occurs, I know what to do, okay? I'm gonna sell the car and the, and the guy who buys it is a prick. I know exactly what I'll do. I sincerely hope that this video points at least one more L405 driver to this issue.